just to give you the background, um, you know, my PhD is in a field called uh, systems biology out of the MIT Department of Biological Engineering. Now that department did not come into being until 2003. I was one of the first graduates out of that department and we should talk about why that came. After I graduated, I did a very um, uh, new thesis of solving a problem which even at MIT people did not think was solvable, which was creating a technology platform to model the entire human cell. Completely uh, a new methodology because it's a revolutionary technology and that technology is called Cytosolve. That was my PhD work. Uh, just to give you an understanding, 50% of the people who take their MIT PhD exams fail. They don't get their PhD. You can count the number of people in the world who get their PhD at MIT. Uh, in fact, getting into an undergraduate degree at MIT is quite a big thing, which I was very humble and I didn't really talk about. You know, Out of the hundreds of thousands of people who apply, about a thousand get in. I was one of the 1,040 students who came in in 81. And in fact, I was a three out of the 1,040 who was featured on the front page of MIT when I walked in for inventing the first email system in the world, you know, before I came to MIT. Uh, after MIT, after my undergraduate degree, I went and worked at a company where I created one of the first, uh, was one of the senior engineers at a company that created one of the first presentation graphic system or predecessor to PowerPoint that got sold to what was now known as IBM. Then I came back and I did my master's at the MIT Media Lab in the early ways to do scientific visualization of very complex data. And then I, that was my master's and I also ended up getting another master's in applied and theoretical mechanics on really understand wave propagation in materials. And everyone wants me to do a thing on 5G and I'm putting that together but I understand wave theory. And then I went and started another company to analyze email uh, after winning a competition for the White House and I built that company at around 250 million in value and that was a company to analyze email for the biggest Fortune 1000 companies in the world. We built a technology, what you would call AI, we call pattern analysis. Then after that I came back to MIT in 2003 to pursue my PhD in this field called systems biology and after that I ended up winning one of the prestigious Fulbright scholarships, took two years off to India to study the integration of Eastern and Western medicine and that was featured on the front page of, the, of MIT because People found an interesting guy with four degrees wants to go back and study traditional systems of medicine. I was also nominated for the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, uh, uh, which the pre United States President gives away. And um, uh, I, most recently, I was invited to present the prestige lecture, lecture at the National Science Foundation. And you can go and look at my resume. A guy like me, typically, uh, would sit around academia in a very lofty position and uh, be stayed, but that's not who I am. The position I took was very different. I built my own research institution. I went and did my own innovations. I made you know, tens of millions of dollars by inventing. So this gives me a significant distance from owing anything to anyone. So I think those credentials are important to understand. I've written many books. Um, I get invited all over the world. I'm recognized as one of the leading people in the field of precision and personalized medicine and one of the leaders in, on the immune system. Um, medical doctors, to everyone listening, I would say a fraction of them, maybe 1% of them understand the immune system. They're not qualified. The immune system is a very complex system and that's why the field of systems biology came. Share that with you. First of all, as we talked about, viruses do not harm or kill us. It's the overreaction from a weakened and dysfunctional immune system to the virus that hurts us. And it's that dysfunctional immune system response is a result of under, you know, uh, underlying pre-existing conditions. And here's some of them. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, smoking, immunocompromise, and let's not forget the environment. Dirty air, dirty water, dirty food. So in summary, if you look at most of the people who are dying out there, it's not healthy people. 90, 99% of them already have had other diseases. They have an obesity issue, diabetes issue, immunocompromise, or they're the elderly as their immune systems go down. That is not being featured. Again, that's not being highlighted. I don't see Tucker Carlson talking about it. I don't see CNN talking about it. And Tucker, if you're listening, you probably will talk about it, but you won't put me on because you're so damn afraid of guys like me because you want to be a grifter. And it's really, really unfortunate because this message should be going out to tens of millions. In fact, Fox News, by the way, called us, wanted to have me on, and then they got scared back by their executives. A very nice woman who said, Shiva, my, my mother saw your videos. 
I want you on, and then she was nixed. That's what goes on with mainstream media. I say shut off mainstream media. They don't deserve your eyeballs, period. It's really, really disgusting. But the bottom line is that it's an overreactive immune system. We got viruses all around. We're being attacked. But when your immune system is overreactive and dysfunctional, your body goes attacks itself. That's what's actually going on. Okay? So let's talk about that. Now, what I'm showing you here, you've heard the term cytokine storm, okay? So what is a cytokine storm? I'm going to I'm going to walk you through this now and this is what's going on. What's going on is that your body has these multiple systems of of the immune system. When you feed it properly through right nutrition, and again, nutrition isn't even talked about by Tucker Carlson or CNN or any of these guys, okay? Tucker Carlson will start getting really upset talking about something else, which he watches what I'm doing, but he, but maybe now he will, but he, they will never talk about nutrition, they will never talk about food, they will never talk about vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin C, and we can go down the zinc and all that, okay? Why won't they talk about it? Because it does not support their narrative, which is their buddies that they hang around with their clubs, which are from Big Pharma. Now, what happens when you have a compromised immune system? So imagine you have six cylinders and only two are working. Well, while only two are working, those two will overreact. So in your body, you have the innate immune system, you have the interferon system, you have the adaptive system, you have your amazing gut microbiome, you have your neural system. Well, when all of these are working together, your body knows how to take a hit, come back strong, and get stronger. But if one of your immune systems, for example, your macrophages in your innate, innate system are shot up because you eat too much freaking sugar, okay? And, it, and you have gliotoxins, which knocks out your macrophages as well as your T-cells. Now you're just reliant on what's called cytokines. So when a virus comes in, your own body not only tries to attack it, it overreacts and it unleashes cytokines. So this is a good diagram that represents that. So what you're seeing, because we're talking about acute respiratory distress here, you're here you see your, your, T, your activated T cells, your activated macrophages, your activated neutrophils, your ep, these sub, and including your epithelial. All of these, these little black dots, unleash a cytokine storm and that creates acute respiratory distress, okay? So what's going on is your own body is attacking your own body, okay? Now this doesn't occur to all of us if we have the right nutrients, but it occurs to those people who've destroyed their body, but as you age, your thyroid level functions go down, you don't have proper vitamin A, you're in the house, you don't get enough vitamin D, and what you create is you create the cytokine storm, and that cytokine storm starts attacking your own body. Certain viruses, because of their shedding, sometimes it goes attacks the endothelial, as I've talked about, and you start bleeding. Sometimes it goes attacks your epithelial, and you get fluid edema in the lungs, okay? It manifests itself in different ways based on the individual, based on the exogenous substance, but the bottom line is, is it's an overreactive immune system. I hope that's clear, all right? Don't let anyone BS you anymore, bullshit you anymore, that these viruses, which are all around us, are what harms you. It's an overreactive immune system. So the issue is how do we beef up the immune system? How do we boost it, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about. So I want you to see this carefully because this is sort of what the cytokine storm looks like, all right? Now let's talk about this very interesting paper because I wanted to explain this to you called Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Now when you get that cytokine storm, I'm looking in the lungs at one of your alveoli. So let me explain this. Your lungs, when I breathe in, right? When, you know, if you breathe in, what happens is you increase volume and if you follow Boyle's Law, pressure times volume is a constant. As volume goes up, pressure comes down. Basic chemistry 101, seventh and eighth grade. If you didn't study it, I want to teach you again. PV, P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. It's called Boyle's Law. All it means is that as volume increases, pressure comes down. So when I breathe in, volume increases, the pressure goes down in my lungs, and that's why low pressure air flows in. When you breathe out, volume decreases, pressure increases, and you go out. This is a process of inspiration and expiration, okay? When you breathe in air, inside your lungs are these beautiful little sacs called alveoli, A-L-V-E-O-L-I, alveoli. So you breathe in your air, 
You're getting oxygen in, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to oxygenate your blood. The blood comes from your heart, the blood with CO2 in it, which means quote unquote dirty blood, and then you want to infuse it with oxygen, so now you get oxygenate, oxygenated blood. And all of this is occurring in this beautiful structure called alveoli, okay? So what does that look like? So here's the alveoli, okay? I'm looking at one of them. Now, when an alveoli is under distress, this little beautiful little bulb here, which is called the alveolus, gets filled with fluid. And you know, when you have uh, you know, uh, lung injury, this leads to lung, the endothelial, and the epithelial with increased permeability. What do I mean by that? This is your alveoli. This is the endothelial right here. This is your artery where it's bringing in beautiful, you know, I mean, old blood, and it's going to infuse it with oxygenated blood coming in here. Now, when this is under distress, as I mentioned, when you have this cytokine storm, when this takes place, look what happens. This starts filling up with fluid that's coming in, as, as, as the narrative here says, ALI leads to lung endothelial epithelial injury, increased permeability of the alveolar capillary barrier. That means this capillary here, this barrier breaks down and you start getting fluid in here. And this, it, by the way, on Twitter, etc. And this permeability, you have the ac activation of all these macrophages, which is from your innate immune system. And fundamentally what happens is you start having the cytokine storm in here and look what happens, you get fluid buildup, okay? And all sorts of chemical cytokine storms is taking place as I talked about here. So the cytokine storm is taking place in this little bulb and fundamentally what you have is your little beautiful alveolus is starting to fill with fluid, okay? So you're filled with fluid. Now if you catch it earlier on and people feel that, um, you know, that's why some people are being put on ventilators. Now, what does a ventilator do? Now, people who have healthy lungs, you know, you really have to wonder how much ventilation do you need. If you start pushing that in there, what are you doing here? You're going to start pushing air into a place that's already filled with fluid. So let's think about that. Let's apply basic, simple physics here. You're, you're, you're already filled with water and you're filling this with air. Well, you know what? You can cause more damage as a function of 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 the amount of air that flows. And now this is an article that just came out, you know, today, a bridge between life and death. Most COVID-19 patients put on ventilators will not survive. So let me talk about that. All these ventilator companies are making a ton of money right now building ventilators. So I want to talk about in my letter to President Trump, I talked about four groups of people. The healthy people who I said we should beef them up with some DNA. Then we're talking about the immunocompromised, who I said we should give high dosage DNA, vitamin D and vitamin A. And I talked about the people who are in critical condition. For them, I said we need to get them on vitamin C. High critical, um, what I'm talking about is people who are really critical, okay? Where their lungs are filling up with that fluid. They're older people. And what we're doing is we're putting them on ventilators. Is that the right thing to do? You, you saw one doctor who put out a very interesting video saying he's in the ER and he's seeing people basically, they're turning blue. They're basically suffocating, guys. They're suffocating. These ventilators are suffocating those, I'm not talking about the people whose lungs are okay and they're almost getting there. I'm talking about the really critically ill people. So, article from mainstream media, they're even admitting it. Right here, what, what the article says right here is that, you know, Bridge between life and death. Most COVID patients put on ventilators will not survive. Why the hell are we putting them on ventilators? Well, here's what's happening. If you see this case here, you're starting to fill up right here with the 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 fluid from the cytokine storm. Now, if you if they're in the early stage, you can put them on low ventilation, very low. Okay, these are people who have uh, you know reasonably healthy lungs. So you shouldn't be putting those ventilators on high motion and it'll help some clearing. But what we're doing is we're putting many of these people who are weakened on high ventilation. And look what it does here. It further increases right at the alveolus. So if the injured lung is ventilated with high tidal volumes, that's what they're doing to people. They don't know what to do because a cytokine storm is taking place there. You have a massive cytokine storm and instead of addressing the fluid, think about what, how stupid these people are because they don't understand physics. Again, MDs, nice people. They got the hospital administrators who are making money selling the ventilators. 
So they're telling to put these people who are, as a fluid is building up, I'll put them on ventilators. Am I saying ventilators are not the right thing to do? What I'm trying to say is as if, you, if, if it's low pressure, as people are in low conditions, not that critical, perhaps it could be valuable. But people who are very, very critically ill, whose lungs are really filling up, look what happens. This is what's occurring. And this is, this is a wonderful paper that came out a couple years ago talking about this. It says, if the injured lung is ventilated with high tidal volumes and high inflammation pressure, high stretch ventilation, then lung injury is exacerbated <clears throat> with increased lung endothelial and epithelial injury. What that means is you get more breakage or you have more of the scarring taking place here, more of the macrophages. You're basically increasing the cytokine storm, okay? What you're doing is causing more damage. We're pummeling that, that beautiful little alveolus which is filling up with fluid. It's already injured and you're sending massive pressure in there when, it, when the volume has decreased, so you're gonna have more pressure and you're basically further injuring the lungs, okay? So just think about it, let's just step back. Okay, you got your lung sacs filling up with liquid, you're in critical condition, it's already undergoing a cytokine storm, so remember what the cytokine storm does is, it's your own body starting to eat away at its own tissues, not the virus. It's not the virus, it's your own body cytokines because of the pre-existing conditions now you have the cytokine storm and then you're pummeling it with high pressure air as the fluid is building up. It makes no sense. Here's the solution that, by the way, the solution I'm going to talk about, anyone listening out there, President Trump, if you're listening, people listening out there, listen very carefully. If you have loved ones, this is about saving people's lives. I'm talking about that critical group. What do we do? Well, we don't surely want to do this right? We don't surely want to send more air in there. This is stupid, okay? And that's what that doctor was observing. Let me talk about vitamin C. Now, there have been hundreds and hundreds of papers, hundreds of papers written about the value of vitamin C. I'm not going to talk about the maintenance dose. I'm going to talk about how we should be using IV vitamin C right now in the ICUs, in those critical people, because as a USA News article said, most of them are going to die. You know what? IV vitamin C is safe. You drip it, and that's what we should do first, okay? If these people are gone to that critical condition, give them vitamin C, IV vitamin C. Even in the ICU dosage, it's already in the, you know, in the protocols, you know, 15 to, you know, uh, 30 grams. You know, I propose a much higher thing in that critical condition around 50 to 100. The one, what I told President Trump, we should go in the critical situation on 100 grams. We should be titrating it over a period of 24 hours. But what I want to share with you is what I'm, what I'm uh, presenting here is something that's well written in the literature. And I want to walk you through a couple of papers. Okay? Many, many papers. So here's a paper. Vitamin C may reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation in critically ill patients. A meta-regression analysis, Journal of Intensive Care. Okay, this came out, um, you know, in 2020. Okay, this just came out. So we're talking about is the fact that a meta-analysis where you're taking lots of research and it's clearly showing that vitamin C may reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation. The more we put people on that high pressure, the more cause for damage, especially if a cytokine storm is taking place. We need to address the cytokine storm. Again, stupid people never want to address the core. They want to always address the symptom. They never want to address the core, and this is so reprehensible that Anthony Fauci, supposedly with a little MD tag, are not is not even talking about this. That the ER doctors are seeing this. They don't know what's going on because their hospital administrators who are money makers want to sell ventilators, 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 okay? But as you can see right here, right here, it says vitamin C may reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation in critically ill patients, a regression analysis. Let me give you another one. Vitamin C can shorten the length of stay in the ICU, a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis. Again, you won't see this from CNN. You're not going to see it from Tucker Carlson. Tucker may do it now because he needs eyeballs. And I'm, I'm frankly a little bit uh, not only upset in a critical condition like this, in a situation none of the academics are saying anything about this. No one, 
No one is talking about for the critically ill that let's help them right now in the ICUs. And again, these, this is not my great ideas. This has been talked about in the literature. The issue is why isn't it out there? Vitamin C, again, can shorten the length of stay in the ICU meta-analysis. Here's another one, vitamin C supplementation in the critically ill. And if you can see the conclusion here, if I can read it to you, it says, the administration of intravenous vitamin C may lead to vasopressor sparring effects and reduce need for mechanical ventilation in the critically ill without affecting overall mortality. However, these results should be interpreted in light of limitation of the primary literature and should serve as a preview of upcoming trials in the area. So this one is even being very, very you know, conservative in a major journal. Clearly, it can help reduce the amount of high pressure ventilation. Cytokine storms taking place, you do more high pressure ventilation, you're gonna damage the lungs. So vitamin C at minimum can help reduce the amount of that ventilation, mass ventilation, that pressure that we're putting on the arteries, uh, on the alveoli. Now, I wanna share this very interesting article. This comes from a mainstream journal, which is Pro Pharma, okay? The Journal of the American Medical Association. They're always Pro Pharma, they're funded by Pharma, they're owned by Pharma, even JAMA, okay? Even the Journal of American Medicine, it says the effect of vitamin C infusion on organ failure, on organ failure, on organ failure and biomarkers, on organ failure and biomarkers of inflammation and vascular injury in patients with sepsis and severe acute respiratory failure. That's what we're talking about. And what I want to walk you through is even in this article, where by the way, um, let me just show this example here. I want to show if I can take this away for a second and I'll bring this back up and I'll put that in. You can see even in this paper, they showed in the placebo and below here, vitamin C was nearly about a 20% reduction in terms of really helping uh, the, uh, the, the respiratory issues. So this is placebo, this is vitamin C. More importantly, let me put this back in so I can present this again. They, this is a conservative journal. They even uh, acknowledge, they said vitamin C compared to placebo is associated with a significant reduction in 28-day all-cause mortality and with significant increased ICU free days to 28-day and hospital free days to 60 days, okay? Now, this paper but said we need to do more studies, it's not conclusive, and that's what you would expect from the mainstream media journals. But the point is they agreed that it can reduce the ICU stays. And after this paper was done, one of the uh, another set of leading researchers really exposed even in that paper, how they try to play with statistics, because if you actually looked at the real data, you would find out that it was quite profound. But the reason I wanted to share with you, even on the negative side, even the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is pro pharma, even acknowledge that vitamin C can have massive, massive effects. Now, why does this work? Let's talk about why, so you can get educated on why vitamin C is powerful, okay? First of all, vitamin C is beneficial for these two really main, three reasons, but I, I put it into two categories. First, it inhibits the cytokine storm through immunomodulation and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity, and it is also antiviral. It disrupts viral replication. So let me explain that. So we got all that cytokine storm, again, taking place. People are immunocompromised. So now you have people in the critical condition. They didn't bother to eat well. They, you know, they didn't get enough sunshine. You know, they're older. They're declining, they have uh, pre-existing conditions. So now they're in the ICU. Why does vitamin C work? Well, first of all, it's gonna reduce that cytokine storm. Everyone getting it? We need to reduce the cytokine storm. That's what we need to do. And there's two ways we can do that, that vitamin C helps to do that. It modulates, you know, it's like shock absorbers. It modulates the immune system, okay? It's gonna modulate that immune system. Second, it is gonna, vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant because when the cytokine storm is taking place, there's massive amounts of oxidant, you know, ROS, reactive oxygen species. There's massive amounts of inflammation taking place. That's what we need to attack. We need to take that on so we reduce the fluid, okay? Basic, 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 you know, common sense. You got this bubble, this, this balloon filling up with water. We need to get rid of the water. We need to drain the water. We do that with immunomodulation, which means fight the cytokine storm, and we do that with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity. Vitamin C, but you gotta give it in high dosage so it has a therapeutic and pharmaceutical type effect. 
The other thing is vitamin C is antiviral. It'll actually disrupt viral replication. So when we actually ran this through, you know, our process with Cytosol, by the way, a, a big pitch for Cytosol here. Cytosol is an amazing technology I've talked about. It's something I invented. You know, I invented many other things besides email, uh, echo mail. You can go read it on vhshiva.com. But Cytosol is one of my proud inventions as much as email because we literally are able to interconnect molecular systems. We have a methodology to go down to the molecular level and we can also use this technology to educate you as I'm doing today because I want everyone to actually learn because you're not going to get this from Big Pharma. You're not going to get this from the mainstream media. So what do I mean? So there's two big things. It inhibits the cytokine storm and it really supports antiviral activity. So how does it do that? So I'm going to walk you through this. So first of all, vitamin C is immunomodulation of the cytokine storm, and it kills overactive immune cells. So you get it? So you have all these immune cells which are highly, highly overactive. It's basically someone gone crazy, and you got to take them out. That's what happens when a cytokine storm is taking place, and that's why the lungs start filling up with edema. So what we can do here, right here, what we can see here, is that vitamin C, high dosage goes in, and through a series of pathways here, it, it actually, in a very ironic way, creates reactive oxygen species. It creates a oxidative environment, and this oxidative environment goes and knocks off what's called GAPDH. So on the right here, you see what happens is immune cells are overreactive. That's what happens when you have a cytokine storm. Your own immune cells start getting angry with you, okay? So they get overreactive. And in this case, this chemical, GAPDH, it's overexpressed. There's too much of it. And what vitamin C does through this process in the immune cell, it starts inhibiting GAPDH. And the loss of GAPDH leads to suppression of the activated immune cells that are responsible for creating the cytokine storm and eventually sepsis. So what sepsis is, we start having this infection. Your own body's eating away itself. So your own immune cells are going crazy. They're angry. So what vitamin C does, it goes in and it creates reactive oxygen species, which are essentially, uh, think about it as a whole chemical warfare to go stop, the, uh, lower this GAPDH, which is overexpressed in active immune cells, overreactive immune cells. So you're basically using vitamin C to calm down your immune cells. I repeat that again. Your vitamin C is modulating like a nice shock absorber and modulating things down. But you got to give it in high dosage. We should be giving this immediately to those people who are in critical care. And I hope President Trump is listening to this. And all you doctors out there who I know you care, know this, what I'm saying is true. And you should be fighting for this for those patients if you want to save their lives. Basic molecular systems understanding, which comes from biological engineers like ourselves who actually go in there and see this as an engineering system. We're not here to sell pharmaceutical drug, drugs. If this, do this. If this, put them on a ventilator. No, we got to understand the physics here. So that's step one. The next thing I want to talk about is vitamin C is also powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. What does that mean? So look on the right here. You have the infected epithelial cells, which are the cells on the surface of the alveolus. You have the innate immune cells. All of these cells, when they're overreactive, start putting out these inflammatory cytokines right here. And these inflammatory cytokines over here create the cytokine storm, which results in acute respiratory distress, and you get the disease. Well, vitamin C literally comes in blocks as well. How does it do this? Well, vitamin C is a potent antioxidant, and it scavenges all those virus-induced uh, free radicals, as well as restoring other cellular antioxidants. And then vitamin C also inhibits the activation, if you want to know some chemistry, what's called NF-kappa-beta, nuclear factor kappa-beta, a major nuclear transcription factor that's involved in the release of numerous pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what vitamin C is doing is, first of all, it knocks down those pro-inflammatory, the things that are causing the fire, it knocks them down because it's a very, very powerful anti-inflammatory and it's an antioxidant, okay? It's, it's serving to gobble up all those free radicals, okay? So the immunomodulation, you're modulating the immune system, you're knocking out free radicals, and you're also uh, inhibiting the activation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, okay? That's what vitamin C should be doing. We need to be giving this IV, you know, even if we... Don't go, what I'm talking about, 100 grams, even the 50, 15 to 30 
grams, you know, every six hours. Very, very beneficial. We should be doing this right now for those patients, particularly the critically ill. Again, the USA News article is saying that they're going to die anyway. So let's give it to those people right away. So that's vitamin C, okay? I hope that helps. And a couple of other points that you want to take away is vitamin C has an antiviral activity, okay? If you look at this diagram here, here's a cell surface. The virus comes in. It attaches to the ACE2 receptor. We're talking about coronavirus. So when you talk about the coronavirus, the coronavirus, to, to give you some basic understanding here, you have the, the, the cell surface. The coronavirus lands on it like a lunar lander. It lands and it connects to what's called the AC2E module. It tries to stick in there and then it tries to get into the cell. But it attaches to the ACE2 receptor. Thanks. So in the case of vitamin C, um, what it does, as we'll see here, vitamin C um, blocks. So once the once once it gets in, the now you see right here on the left side to the left of vitamin C, we're seeing that the that the uh, virus is inside your cell. Then it starts replicating this little green thing right here in, in these blue areas. Your ribosome starts replicating itself right into here, and then what it's doing is. Vitamin C stops this RNA replication. So it stops that. That's one thing. So it stops the nucleic acid replication. Then if it makes it past this, it starts replicating. It starts assembling the virus into here. If it makes it past this, it starts replicating. It starts assembling the virus into here. Well, guess what? Vitamin C stops that. It inhibits the virus assembly. And then it inhibits the virus particle getting out and replicating itself. This is quite powerful. It's an antiviral activity. So vitamin C works in three ways. It inhibits the nuclear acid replication process. It inhibits the viral, viral virus assembly here. And it inhibits the virus particle transport. So think about that. <laughs> vitamin C is amazing. It's freaking amazing. It has antiviral activity. And this is not something that is sort of weird that only the vitamin people take and only the vitamin supplements people. This has been known for many, many years. And the fact that Anthony Fauci, the fact that people advising the president are not talking about this is frankly criminal because there are people dying right now which they claim they want to help, but they seem like they're more into quarantining us, flattening the stupid curve not helping those people that are ill. And they got all the idiots out there flattening the curve, flattening the curve, flattening the curve. Okay, flatten the curve. But what about those people who are dying right now? Why don't we hit them with IV vitamin C? IV vitamin C, as you know, as I shared here, just to summarize, you know, it has three different activities here. It inhibits the cytokine storm through immunomodulation, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory activity, and it's antiviral. It disrupts a viral replication disrupts it by taking on GAPDH. It is anti-inflammatory. It stops the cytokine storm by taking away uh, the oxidizing agents, the reactive oxygen species, and it takes out NF-kappa-beta and inhibits the activation. And then finally, it's got antiviral activity. It stops this entire viral replication process. And by the way, here's some other important things. You know, it increases cellular immunity, right? Uh, of your white blood cells, neutrophils. It increases humoral activity of your B cells and the antibodies in your adaptive immune system. It increases antiviral properties in your interferon system. It increases energy by providing necessary electrons for the movement of your mitochondria. It limits the main source of fuel of pathogenic organisms, sugar, when provided in, pharma, when provided in those high dosage. And it maintains structural integrity of your cells by collagen formation. So think about this. Vitamin C is like an amazing, powerful weaponry. Much better than any pharmaceutical drug at this point for those critically ill patients. Meanwhile, we have a bunch of hospital administrators forcing everyone on ventilators. So just think about that, what's going on to this country right now and to people who are critically ill. Yet, IV vitamin C, cheap. And the problem is, I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a medical doctor. Well, we gotta give drugs, you know, hydrochloroquine. Yeah, okay, we're going to talk about that shortly. But they don't want to talk about vitamin D, A, and C. They've been so brainwashed. MDs are so brainwashed with big pharma. They're frankly become stupid. It's absolutely insane that we're not in critical care giving people IV vitamin C. So that's 
One of the things I proposed in the letter to President Trump, I tweeted it to him because God knows all the idiots that surround him, if they're even going to open it up and give it to him. So we tweeted it at him. So President Trump, if you're listening to this, you got to help people by recognizing that it's IV vitamin C for the critically ill. Let's start saving lives. That's why the title of this is Saving Lives. Let's talk about topic number two. Let's talk about vitamin D and A. Okay, now let's move to, because I want to have the discussion of hydro, hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine. Let's talk about that. Now, people are saying let's give hydroxychloroquine. By the way, hydroxychloroquine is going to do nothing for people who are critically ill and putting them on ventilators is going to do nothing. That's, let's say, you know, the, the highly critical group. Now you have people who have, who you think are asymptomatic. You have a family member who's got it. Someone's got it. So the notion is you give uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, chloroquine, you know, earlier, okay, as a prophylactic. And I'm going to show to you that it has some benefits and it has side effects. But before I go there, if you want to prevent yourself from being attacked by the virus, you want to shield your family and your loved ones so they don't go into that critical condition, there's two things you can take right now, which I also put in the letter to the president which was, let's take people who have COVID-19, who've tested positive for that, let's take people who are immunocompromised, which is the next group, let's take people who are healthy. Now, the first two groups, people who have COVID-19 or in, in their family area or people who are immunocompromised, high dosage vitamin D, you gotta give a big shot of it, uh, uh, 50,000 IU for two days, and or 400,000 IU of vitamin A. By the way, these are pediatric doses. People say, oh my God, that's high. Go read the literature. If you don't believe me, it's been there. 80,000 papers written on vitamin D, tens of thousands of papers written on vitamin A. So what? What can? why is vitamin D and A good? I've talked about this. If you go to the videos at Truth, Freedom, and Health, you can go and go through the details, but let me just review. Vitamin D is antimicrobial. Vitamin D is like the musket. It produces bullets called cathelicidins, which literally take out and disrupt the walls of the bacteria and disrupt the walls of, you know, uh, viruses, etc. They lyse them. They break them up. That's what vitamin D can do in one massive shot. If you take it regularly, it has even better effect. Vitamin A builds the beautiful walls, the cytokeratin walls, so the viruses can't even enter. Okay, this is something that's a prophylactic, it supports you, it's a preventative. Okay, so how does that work? Let's go into it and study the, again, the chemistry, again, the biology, again, the science. Okay, so you have your alveoli here. This is the epithelial. These are the alveolar macrophages. And here are these little viruses swimming around here to the left of TNF. So what happens? Well, your macrophages... There are two kinds, the anti-inflammatory and the pro-inflammatory. The pro-inflammatory would get kicked in when you're attacked by a virus. And what those macrophages have the ability to do in the presence of vitamin D is they create these particles called CAMPS, catholicidin antimicrobial particles. These are antimicrobial peptides that are evolutionarily conserved. They're the oldest mechanism of action towards microbial pathogens, and, and, and they involve pathogen cell disruption of the bacteria and viruses. So what do I mean by that? These, you get vitamin D, hopefully if you get it from the sun, the UVB radiation, your body takes that sun and it creates vitamin D. Then that vitamin D is like your gun, okay? The vitamin D goes through a series of processes and it creates its bullets called catholicidins, which literally disrupt the cell membrane. And these catholicidins go back for millennia. They've been around, they're like the, one of the oldest antimicrobials. And again, unfortunately, the poor, poor, poor victimized MDs of big pharma don't even know this. And I have a lot of friends of that. Vitamin D, they scratch their heads. That's too simple of a solution. Vitamin D is a hormone. It affects so many processes. They're always looking for a freaking drug. It's so sad. These guys who pay a lot of money to go get all that training don't even know the power of vitamin D. And it's one of the most important things that's antimicrobial. By the way, when, frankly, stupid fake science Anthony Fauci is talking about flattening the curve, you know what's really going to happen? When the sun comes out and we start getting vitamin D, we're going to see this go away. And they're going to say, oh, it's because we flatten the curve, we wash hands and social distancing. That's what they'll give it to. 
They're going to give it to that, not because of vitamin D. And this is what how fake science starts because they don't want to focus on actual simple solutions because that means no more money for Fauci, no more money for his friends at MIT, Harvard, all these people who get funding. Well, imagine we said vitamin D works. Where is all their funding? It, it's all gone. That's what we're talking about. These guys do not want simple solutions. They want you know, complicated solutions. That's why they need their little white jackets and their little stethoscope and their bow ties because they got to create this wizardry. When there's no wi wizardry, you're looking at a simple engineer, got a bunch of degrees at MIT, but I'm a working class guy, you know, no, no different than a plumber or electrician. When I look at this problem and when you look at this with common sense, what comes out of here is very simple. Vitamin C, stop the cytokine storm, okay? Vitamin C, stop the cytokine storm. Vitamin D, let's take out, it's an antimicrobial, okay? So how does that work, okay? And we'll talk about vitamin A, protects your layer. So what does vitamin uh, D do? Well, here's, again, here's the mechanisms. This is what we do at Cytosol, we study mechanisms. Here's a cell wall, here's vitamin D coming in. That's what this chemical here is. D3, by the way, if you're gonna get it, get coke caliciferol. It comes in, you know, innervates your nuclear membrane, and guess what? Your body then produces VDRs, you know, vitamin D receptors, and this process then produces these little little circles over here called CAMPs, catholicine and antimicrobial. So what happens is your body will, your, your your immune cells will suck in that virus into these phagosomes, but without these catholicidins, you're not able to go and capture them and then lyse them and take them out. So let me show you here. This was a very nice paper that came out. And what it shows is, this is a paper that just came out, in fact, uh, March 2019, one year ago. Look what it says. Almost all catholicine and show in simple media direct antimicrobial activity against many different bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And by the way, these are these catholicine and molecules. This is in pig. This is in chicken and this is in humans, LL37. And you can see here that right here that the bacteria, uh, as you give more and more CMPs, look what happens. It kills bacteria, but it also does the same thing to viruses. By the way, those people on Instagram, when we end, I'll restart it again. So please come back about 142. Instagram has this problem that it only lets you go for an hour. So I'll restart it right when this ends. Now, what does happen is catholicidins literally attack a bacteria and these catholicidins, see these little uh, triangular red things? These are things that literally go around the bacterial membrane or the viral membrane and they literally break it up. They destroy the virus uh, or the bacterial membrane. They're like bullets. And I'll show you another example here. This is a control, this left column, and we're looking at different types of catholicidins effects in pig, in, in chicken, and over here on humans. And what you see here is quite fascinating. I'm looking at the humans. Here's a beautiful bacteria that's preserved. And here you can see it's being disrupted. Same here in another case that literally the catholicines go blow up and disrupt the bacteria. So, so, so bottom line, <laughs> again, this is not my work. You know, uh, what I'm a systems guy, I put together and connect the dots with tools like Cytosol. What we're seeing here is that Vitamin D is a powerful antimicrobial, but it has many, many other effects, okay? I don't wanna just limit it to that. But bottom line, what vitamin D is doing is it's protecting you. It's, so when people have in critical condition, or if you're with people who are hurt or, or they're infectious, please take vitamin D. If you don't believe me, go read the papers. I'm gonna do it for myself. It's up to you if you do it for, for yourself. I take anywhere between five to 10,000 IUs. But those people are surrounded by infection or have COVID-19, take high dosage as I've written to the president if you want to review it. One second, I'm going to really start this up again. And I'm going to go live again. There we go. People will be coming back on Instagram. So that's, that's how vitamin D works. Now, let's go on to vitamin C, okay? I mean vitamin A. Vitamin A, as you age, as you age, one of the things that happens is your thyroid level goes down, you get less vitamin A because your body's uh, not able to convert those beautiful green vegetables, those carotenoids, into vitamin A. Vitamin A is also recommended to the President of the United States. 
that we should give high dosage vitamin A, about 400,000 IU for two days, about 50,000 IU of vitamin D for two days for people who, again, as a prophylactic, if you're surrounded by people having you want to protect yourself or you take the, you know, the regimented dosages if you're a healthy person. And what vitamin A does, it literally produces these beautiful walls as I show you here. So here's your cells in green. Look at those beautiful red you know, walls. So these are cytokeratins, okay? Very much like vitamin C supports it. The vitamin A does it even more directly, okay? Vitamin A literally is beautifully encasing your cells, protecting them. Why is that important? Well, that's like putting on some armor around yourself so the, the virus particles can't even get in. They can't even connect to those receptors. That's why this is important. It's really, really important to understand the power of A and D as a preventative as well as a curative uh, measure for you, for you or people who are under stress, okay? So there you go, vitamin DNA. Now, having given that, let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. Okay, everyone ready? Everyone ready for hydroxychloroquine? If you wanna tweet everyone that hydroxychloroquine's coming, you may wanna let them know that, okay? Let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. Everyone's heard about this, but what is it, okay? So hydroxychloroquine, you know, by the way, it's preventative. Um, there's a number of people saying it, um, and there seems to be some very positive beneficial effects of it, giving it way earlier on. Again, we've talked about the critically ill. Forget hydroxychloroquine there. You got to hit them with the vitamin C IV. But now we're talking about people who think they're going to get it as a preventative. So what people have said is, hey, let's give people hydroxychloroquine as a measure. President Trump has said this. And so I want to have an objective view of this, okay? Um, and what you see here is, in fact, the Indian Council of Medical Research recommended all healthcare workers, those who are involved in the care. Hello everyone, we're going to start shortly. We'll be bringing in people from Periscope. This is Dr. Shiva Adure. I hope everyone's doing well. And, and disrupt the bacteria. So, so, so bottom line, <laughs> again, this is not my work. You know, uh, what I'm a systems guy, I put together and connect the dots. Red, you know, walls. So these are cytokeratins, okay? Very much like vitamin C supports it. The vitamin A does it even more directly, okay? Vitamin A literally is beautifully encasing your cells, protecting them. Why is that important? Well, that's like putting on some armor around yourself to, so the, the virus particles can't even get in. They can't even connect to those receptors. That's why this is important. It's really, really important to understand the power of A and D as a preventative as well as a curative uh, measure for you, for you or people who are under stress, okay? So there you go, vitamin DNA. Now, having given that, let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. Okay, everyone ready? Everyone ready for hydroxychloroquine? If you wanna tweet everyone that hydroxychloroquine's coming, you may wanna let them know that, okay? Let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. Everyone's heard about this, but what is it, okay? So hydroxychloroquine, you know, by the way, it's preventative. Um, there's a number of people saying it, um, and there seems to be some very positive beneficial effects of it, giving it way earlier on. Again, we've talked about the critically ill. Forget hydroxychloroquine there. You got to hit them with the vitamin C IV. But now we're talking about people who think they're going to get it as a preventative. So what people have said is, hey, let's give people hydroxychloroquine as a measure. President Trump has said this. And so I want to have an objective view of this, okay? 
Um, and what you see here is, in fact, the Indian Council of Medical Research recommended all healthcare workers, those who are involved in the care of suspected confirmed cases of COVID-19, take around 400 milligrams twice a day uh, on day one, followed by 400 milligrams once weekly for the next seven weeks to be taken with meals. And they also said asymptomatic households, which means people are not showing the sympt symptoms, uh, uh, household contacts of laboratory confirmed cases, may be prescribed 400 milligrams twice a day on day one, followed by 400 milligrams once weekly for the next three weeks to be taken with meals. So what this is saying is that if you are a medical worker and you're interacting with people who may have it, if um, you went to a lab, you know, you went to visit someone, that this could be protective for you. So what is hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine and how does it work? So I want to educate you on this because again, the media does jack about this. They don't really, they either take Fauci's positions or they want to promote, so very few people want to promote Trump's position, but, um, or they promote it. Some people do, some of the grifters will support it, right? The people on Fox or CNN, they'll support it without really understanding why. But it's important that we go back to basic science. This is not a left or right issue. This is about life and death. It's not left or right. It's not Republican or Democrat. So let's talk about that. So what are we talking about here? So let me go back to the slides here. So what are we talking about? So here, what we're talking about is, um, let me uh, take you a closer look here. If you look at the cell wall here, that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at a wall. And as I've shared before, this little orange substance is called the ACE2 receptor. Well, guess what? The, the virus, the way it enters the cell, but the, the virus, the way it enters the cell is it's got to, so if the AC2 receptor is here is like a, a glove, it's got to come in and lock into it, okay? So here's the virus particle. It, it locks in, and in order for, for it to lock in, it's got to go through a process called gly, glycosylation, okay? Glycosylation. I'm not going to get into what that process is, but in order for this to occur, glycosylation has to take place at the AC2 receptor. It's a chemical process um, where glycoproteins are, go through a metabolic process, but it's a glycosylation. So in order for the virus here to, this is your cell surface, to stick into that AC2 receptor, it's gotta go through the process of glyco glycosylation. Well, guess what hydroxychloroquine does? From the, from the mechanistic analysis that we've been able to understand, it inhibits virus entry. So that's a good thing. So it literally blocks this virus particle from interacting with the ACE2 receptor. And that's where we talk about the inhibition of the glycosylation of ACE2 receptor and these spike proteins, and it's an inhibition of the virus of particle binding to the ACE2 receptor. There's a spelling mistake there. And it's reduced virus entry. So what you're doing is, one part is you're stopping that virus particle from coming in to the cell. To the cell. Okay, that's a good thing. Very good thing. Okay? Now, the other thing that, that, the, uh, that the hydroxychloroquine does, it also inhibits viral replication, okay? So remember, when I shared with you, vitamin C inhibits viral replication. So does hydroxychloroquine. That's a good thing. And how does it do it? Again, the same diagram here, you can see that hydroxychloroquine here stops the RNA replication right here. So as the virus comes in, it puts out its nucleic acid and it starts replicating. Boom, it stops it there. It also stops the inhibition of the virus assembly. So this RNA has got to go into the, you know, into the part, into the, into the virus shell that's emerging. It stops that. And it also stops the, the, the virus particle transport. It, it blocks all these three things. That's amazing. So hydroxychloroquine stops the virus particle or reduces the virus entry and it stops a replication process in three ways. But those three ways are the ways that also vitamin C works, okay? So one of the important principles that medical doctors are supposed to learn, we in engineering learn it. When you build something, you wanna make sure you don't blow up people, you wanna make sure you don't hurt people. In medicine, it's called do no harm. So you have here what I've talked about, vitamin DNA, as a prophylactic, as a preventative, it can also be used in, in those intense conditions where someone is being infected, very, very powerful. And for critical care people, the vitamin C. But now we're let's weigh, okay, you've been exposed to someone, or you think you may have it as a prophylactic. The goal is hydroxychloroquine is being promoted. I'm here to tell you that you can have 
the same opportunity with vitamin D and A. Vitamin D and A, remember, vitamin D is an antimicrobial. It stops that replication process. It blows up the cells with the cathelicidins. I'm sorry, vitamin D. And vitamin A it protects you with those beautiful cytokeratin uh, uh, armor, okay? So the cytokeratin armor is protecting you from vitamin A coming through, and then vitamin D is taking out those back, back, uh, uh, the walls of the disrupts the cell membranes. So what do you choose? Do you go vitamin D and A, or do you choose hydroxychloroquine? And by the way, hydroxychloroquine appears to work even better with zinc because zinc also stopped that viral replication. So the one way to look at it is, um, by the way, hydroxychloroquine, another important feature is also inhibits the cytokine storm. So remember, I shared with you here the epithelial cells. Oh, let me go back to the PowerPoint here. It Epithelial cells and the infected cells are creating a cytokine storm. Well, hydroxychloroquine, it has the inhibition of the inflammatory cytokines, for example, TNF-alpha. It disrupts the cellular iron homeostasis. It inhibits TNF-alpha mRNA expression. It, hit, it, it starts, it stops the inhibition. I mean, it's inhibition of the pre-translational stage, and it's an inhibition at the post-translational stage. And basically, it attenuates the inflammatory response, thereby, thereby controlling the cytokine storm. So again, another powerful aspect of hydroxychloroquine, it stops the cytokine storm, okay? And as I shared with you, that's very similar to what you know, vitamin D also, um, vitamin C helps do. Vitamin C helps stop the uh, cytokine storm, um, and hydroxychloroquine does that, okay? So what are you going to do? Do you take your vitamin D, A, and C in a prophylactic, or do you take hydroxychloroquine, particularly for those people that the Indian government has recommended, those healthcare workers? And, and here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. Hydroxychloroquine does have side effects, and you can li list them, okay? It's got a number of them, uh, as I'm putting here, 1 to 33 from diarrhea, simple diarrhea to headaches all the way to low loss of hearing to stomach pain, uh, you know, swelling of the feet and lungs, and it goes on, okay? Um, these are documented throughout the literature, yellow eyes or skin, nightmares, nervousness, irritability, unusual behavior, unconsciousness, so on. So look, everyone knows that I have a deep, deep regard for the President of the United States, He's been a disruptor against both parties, against the establishment. I have spent a lot of time, and all of we have, we, we have the campaign called Fire Fauci. By the way, nearly 30 to 40,000 people have now signed up there. And nearly there's about 1,000 uh, MDs which have signed up. It's quite extraordinary. People are understanding that we have the agent of uh, big pharma, big vaccine, you know, uh, the WHO, CDC, the, the whatever the top-down model of the the Chinese want to do, that's Fauci. I think we understand that as a clear, obvious establishment. But as, as I've shared in many of my talks, next to the establishment, we also have the not so obvious establishment. Around Trump are also running around a lot of the pharma guys. Remember, pharma is failing. They're not doing well. Their big goal is mandated vaccines, big profit because they can't get sued, but they still want to get their drugs through, okay? So I have to with all due respect, because I'm a scientist, because I believe in do no harm, have to share both sides. So what you look at is I've shared the very powerful, very powerful things that hydroxychloroquine can do. No doubt about it. It inhibits virus entry, it inhibits viral replication, and it inhibits a cytokine storm. However, what we need to understand is that it has nearly a, a 61 side effects. And just to give you this analysis, you can see that Sanofi stock was crashing, okay? By the way, Sanofi, hydroxychloroquine is a generic, no different than ibuprofen is, but we all know that a lot of people go like to buy the Advil, right? Because it has that brand equity. So yeah, from a marketing standpoint, we could say, oh yeah, it's a generic, I can go get it anywhere, ibuprofen, but people still trust the brand. The brand has a lot of value. Well, in the case of Sanofi, which is a French company, you know, Plaquenil, Plaquenil is their brand version of hydroxychloroquine. And look at what happened right after Trump announced their stock, which was in the ten, which was tanking here, you know, nearly to 70, has in fact got almost a 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent boost here. Okay. So what's the summary here? In summary, and we'll make, maybe we'll take some questions. Is that vitamin C for critically ill, no side effects. Vitamin DNA preventative and supportive, no side effects. If we go to hydroxychloroquine, it's preventative, take it with zinc, but it has around 61 side effects. 
And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I wanted to share with you. The bottom line is, you know, we really have to consider, you know, yes, this has effects, but do we want to do we want to swim with big pharma again? Do we want to let them get in or do we want to use this opportunity to start educating all of ourselves vitamin C, a vitamin, vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamins. And if there's one thing you take away from this, for those in critical care, please recognize those are highly critically ill people, whether it's coronavirus or whatever, but their lungs are filling up with water edema and you're putting more and more air in there without addressing the core issue which is a cytokine storm with IV drip vitamin C it's absolutely criminal that's why that doctor who put out a video he's saying this is not helping and he's absolutely right we're actually asphyxiating these people we're drowning them that's what we're doing number two you have two choices now you can take the drug which Sanofi can make a lot of money from from their brand yes it's a generic right it has 61 side effects or what about vitamin DNA that's the choice but I want to give you this choice and I once again want to tell the president of the United States that I'm here to help you I'm here to share all this knowledge which we're doing directly and the mainstream media is not going to do this because they're followers they have their interests in big pharma to the extent they'll watch my video see how many hits they got then Tucker Carlson may carry it because it helps him act like though he cares for people he's a he's a master grifter that's what Tucker is. He had many opportunities to support me even during my election campaign, but he frankly pussied out because he got hit with other issues. And but it's time.